North American railroading is always changing and evolving, and some might even say devolving. What's here today is gone tomorrow, and that's what makes the job of a rail fan so important. As rail fans, we're the keepers of the memories of the days of railroading gone by, but with the sweeping changes taking place in 2020, it's getting harder and harder to do. I'm Rail Fan AC, and you're watching Trains in the 21st Century. It wasn't that long ago that you saw this train, and I mean that statement literally and figuratively. It's the train 37T, or at least it was. It was abolished early last month. What I didn't tell you about this train was that it stalled about two miles up the line. What a surprise. But to be fair to NS, it wasn't caused by human error this time around, but instead mechanical error. The third unit, the Dash 944 CW number 9610, malfunctioned upgrade and brought the train to a complete stop. In response, the K79 local switcher had to take their power, tack onto the rear of the 37, and nurse the disabled train to Clark Summit. Another thing that I didn't show you was the Delaware Lackawanna train DL3 waiting patiently on the Y to make their move down to Taylor Yard. Several changes to this view have been made over the past five years. Besides that chain link fence that all but destroyed the ground level view, some changes have actually been in our favor. That pesky tree that obscured our view from the west side of the tracks was cut down last year as were many of the obscuring trees on the east side of the tracks. The east side changes being a result of the remodeling and add-ons to that gray building on the left. These changes now give us an unobscured high angle view from both sides of the tracks. Now if I can just keep the DL trains from blocking my shots. Northumberland was founded in 1772 and was purchased from the Iroquois Indians in the first treaty of Fort Stanwix in 1768. The village was laid out in 1772 and was evacuated during the big runaway of the American Revolution in 1778. It was finally resettled in 1784. In video T-173, we learned a little bit about the former Delaware Lackawanna and Western Bloomsburg branch, a.k.a. the Bloom. And we also got a quick look at the Front Street Station at Norrie. Front Street Station is a 1910 Pennsylvania Railroad station that's been transformed into an upscale restaurant. So prominent is Front Street to the area that the Central Pennsylvania chapter of the National Railway Historical Society newsletter is named after the station's now permanent Pennsylvania passenger car, the Susquehannock. In 1860, a smaller, wooden passenger station was built on the site by the Pennsylvania Railroad but was destroyed by fire after the turn of the century. In 1908, construction began on the building you see here in addition to an expanded classification yard which became the fifth largest railroad yard 
in the United States. When the building was completed, it opened the way for the Pennsylvania Railroad's flourishing passenger train service that brought 18 trains to town each day. The station closed in 1958 and remained closed until Jay Seidel purchased the building in 1981 and restored it for his restaurant. Front Street Station Restaurant opened for business on August 1, 1983. Behind the station is C.P. Nori, which is the gateway to Northumberland Yard and Central Pennsylvania. In years past, Norrie was a busy yard, but like so much infrastructure today on Norfolk Southern, Norrie sees minimal train traffic. The bright spot at Northumberland is the resident short line, the North Shore Railroad, and one of its subsidiaries, the Shimokan Valley Railroad, that are both headquartered in town. One other bright spot is that the NS train H53 that we talked about in that same video, T173, is back on a morning departure schedule from Northumberland to Enola and return. NS had made this an evening train last fall, but apparently that didn't work out too well, so NS reverted back to the schedule that had been in place for the last several years. Looking to the north, the track on the right is the easternmost of three mainline tracks through the yard. And notice that turnout up yonder. That runs behind a business called Fermano's. I don't know this for certain, but I think that they either ship or receive canned goods in those boxcars. Scenes like these are disappearing in railroading as Class 1s are abandoning carload freight in favor of end-to-end -end unit trains. About 60 miles northwest from Norrie is the Norfolk Southern Lock Haven Yard in the town of Lock Haven. Convenient. Sarcasm aside, like Norrie, Lock Haven is mostly quiet, but also like Northumberland, a North Shore Railroad subsidiary calls Lock Haven its home. This time it's the Nittany and Bald Eagle Railroad. The GP38 number 2004 is a North Shore loco painted in an Erie Lackawanna inspired paint scheme. And the Black 3379 is another ex-con that did its time working in local service in our neck of the woods on the Sunbury Line's Taylor Yard. Moving over to what was once the Sunbury Line but is now the River Line, it's a bitter cold January morning in the small riverside town called Riverside. There are several rail served agricultural industries in town and this place, Merck Chemical. Unlike the north end of the River Line which is served by the K81 Taylor Switcher, Riverside is served by the K21 and K22 Northumberland Switchers. Across the river from Riverside is the Delaware Lackawanna and Western Railroad town of Danville. As we learned again in video T173, Danville is one of the many towns and boroughs that the Bloom Line runs through between Norrie and Berwick. We also learned that Danville is home to a future transload site that's currently under construction. One little known fact about Danville is that it's said to have the oldest documented rail trail in the entire United States. This of course is alleged. The J. Manley Robbins Trail which runs through the outskirts of town is the former railroad line for the Montour which was the 10 ton narrow gauge locomotive used for carrying iron ore between deposits and furnaces. The line was converted to a bicycle path in the 1890s. Listen to that again, 1890s, not 1980s. The original one mile rail bed trail section now connects with adjacent additional trails and recreation amenities near the Mahoning Creek. Rail fanning in central Pennsylvania is a scenic undertaking since there are usually no major highways. Chasing trains is a series of ups and downs and twists and turns. Endlessly changing scenery from farms and villages to towns and churches. This is flyover America. Today we're chasing the daily southbound Binghamton, New York to Enola, Pennsylvania train 11Z. Shown here at a place the railroad calls Banks, if you look ever so closely you'll notice the siding track in the foreground next to the train. It's a hand throw siding not used much from what I can tell and it's known to rail fans as the mud hole. And if you're wondering if you've seen the newly minted NSAC 44 before, you have. It was trailing second on the train 14R that was headed by the Virginian Heritage Unit number 1069 and that was our last railroad catch of 2019 and the decade. The AC44 C6M is the former Dash 944 CW number 9096 and is leading a massive six unit last ship just a few miles from the Buffalo Line in Sunbury at the control point called CP Case. The Pennsylvania Railroad began using CTC on the Buffalo Line way way back in the late 1930s with an installation between Machias, New York and East Aurora, New York but the second phase between Rockville, Pennsylvania and the west end of the Northumberland Yard was accomplished in the late 1950s. Part of the upgrades included this then new block station at Case which replaced the original tower. 
The board with a three-sided union switch and signal design common to the time and the rightmost portion was originally intended to serve the Wilkesbury branch, but the PRR reportedly balked at the cost and opted to close the tower at Nescopec, which controlled a nearly three-mile-long siding near the geographic center of the 60-mile branch. As originally designed, the mainline portion of the project involved controlled sidings at Ferry, which is Clark's Ferry, Miller, which is Millersburg, and Boyle, which is Herndon, Pennsylvania. Double track began at Creek, just south of Sunbury, and continued to Molly at the west end of the Northumberland Yard. The junction to the Wilkesbury line in both directions was accomplished by means of a unique arrangement whereby freights crossing the bridge from Northumberland crossed the eastbound connection at Grade, then looped around the northwest corner of Sunbury. The two lines joined at Banks, another remote controlled interlocking one mile to the north, but in earlier days, double track extended to Raven Tower about five miles to the north. We talked about this funky arrangement in video T108. Link is in the description just in case you missed it. The Shimokan branch could also be accessed directly from the south by means of a connection referred to in earlier electronic timetables as the Haas lead. The old Shimokan branch is now the Shimokan Valley Short Line which operates the line between Sunbury and Mount Carmel. If you're lucky, you might be able to catch the Shimokan Valley leaving Nori and moving on to the Sea of Cog. We were in the right place at the right time, but the contradicting Sunbury streets proved to be too much of an obstacle to catching up to today's local, so we called off the chase. With the ditch lights flashing and air horns blaring, trains through Sunbury like our train 11Z must negotiate close to a dozen grade crossings, none more than a few hundred feet apart from each other. Since train speeds through Sunbury are moderate to slow, it can be a real bane to early morning commuter traffic. I don't get the impression that the people stuck at these crossings are enjoying this show as much as I am. Our train 11Z disappeared to the south, and in a few hours it was sitting in the Anoli Yard. And so were we. Anoli Yard is always an adventure because you just never know what you're going to see. On this day, we see a line of stored SD70 series locomotives including two Phase 2 SD70Ms. Norfolk Southern has been placing hundreds of DC tractive diesels in storage, probably a part of its Top 21 Precision Schedule Railroading initiative. The M-2s went into storage last year as we talked about in video T167. The link to that video is in the description, just in case you missed it. What caught my eye among the various black diesels was the GP38-3 number 5827. These were rebuilt from ex-Southern High Hood GP50s. These new Dash 3s have a low, short hood and have been derated to 2000 horsepower. Note the two cooling fans separated on the roof. 
coupled to the 5827 is the GP59 number 4619 and a former Southern Railway SD40-2 number 3204. The 59 diesel is a truly rare bird, a 12-cylinder, 3,000-horsepower variant of the GP60s. These diesels were only purchased by NS, with some having been rebuilt into GP59Es like the 4661, which we can see here conducting its switching duties along with the slug unit and the GP38-2. Other goodies in the yard was a couple of high hood Jeep 38-2s along with an Admiral cab version and the Norfolk and Western Heritage Unit who despite being flanked by the 5007, it's blue with gold lettering can't be mistaken even amidst a smattering of black and white diesels. A little spoiler about the 8103. We'll see her again in the next video in this series. And as long as we're talking about heritage units, it should also be pointed out that the Wabash heritage unit was also at Enola today. But it was filthy dirty and photographing it would have meant parking the car again which I wasn't in the mood to do. One last FYI before we leave Enola, the 5007, you know the one that photobombed our shot of the 8103, note that spiffy new Admiral cab. This is what she looked like in 2016 before her modern day facelift. On the way back home, we stopped in Tamaqua. Tamaqua is old Reading Railroad in Lehigh and New England territory. It became Conrail territory on Sea Day 1976 and then Reading and Northern's territory when Conrail sold it in the mid-1980s. We were only in town a few minutes when the newly installed signals went from red to green. A southbound was coming into town so we headed straight for the yard. By the time we made it down to street level, the mysterious manifest was crossing the West Broad Street. From Broad Street, we followed the train into the yard. It was being led by the sole Reading and Northern number 2004, an ex-Detroit, Toledo, and Ironton EMD SD38. The train tied down right in front of a loose covered hopper and the crew was done for the day. Snooping around the yard, we spot a variety of open, coal hauling hoppers including some with the America's largest anthracite carrier plaque. This, like most of the Reading and Northern today, is a throwback to the original Reading Railroad that once occupied this yard. At the head of these hoppers were SD40-2s number 3057 and 3055. You might remember them from 2019. As we left Tamaqua Yard in the last workable minutes of daylight, another southbound manifest surprised us. I couldn't get the camera operating fast enough to catch the locomotives, but they were two of the newly acquired XCSX SD50-2s still in blue paint. You'll just have to trust my word on that. The speed of this train clearly shows that it ain't stopping at Tamaqua. Its makeup shows that this is the North Reading Fast Freight heading south to North Reading, Pennsylvania where it will hand this train off to the Norfolk Southern. While there, it will pick up another train to bring back north to Jim Thorpe and Lee Heighton where it will hand it over to the Pittston Fast Freight to the Wilkes-Barre Scranton area. You should remember that train from 2019 too.
Make sure that you hit the like button before you watch the next video and hit the subscribe button if you're not already a subscriber and don't forget to check out the description box for links to other videos that relate to this one. And if you haven't checked out our community section, make sure that you take a look in there. That's where we make all of our channel announcements and you can find lots of pics, some obscure videos, and a lot of talk about trains. For Trains 21, call me AC. Thank <laughs> you.